Joining us now on Practical 365 is Mike Weaver. Hi, Mike. How are you? Hi, Steve. I'm doing well. How are you today? I am not bad. Uh, so for those that don't know you, um, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you, you do uh, in your role uh, at Quest and, and also where you blog and stuff like that? Absolutely. So uh, my name is Mike Weaver. I work for Quest as a technical product manager specializing in merger acquisitions and divestitures, and uh, which for a lot of people can be a nightmare. For me, it's interesting. <laughs> uh, and I also have my blog, madmike.net, and obviously also contribute to P365 and a few other of the community forums. So there's there's so much going on with with tenant to tenant migrations uh, at the moment, uh, and so many sort of big open questions uh, around that. So uh, I, I know this is as you say this is the thing you do. So I wanted to ask some so some key things that that have been on my mind lately, uh, and I thought might be really interesting. So uh, it's been a big year for for tenant migrations. Uh, you joined me on on, on the other podcast um, last year. And we were talking about migrations uh, back then uh, but over the last year is there anything that's that's really sort of changed have microsoft released anything that's been really useful to to enable those migrations to be more smooth or or have more fidelity yeah absolutely so there's some new options that have been uh, out at ignite there are some additional announcements that came out i think what we have to keep in mind in this space is at the same time as we're getting more migration options we're also getting more complexity and challenges yeah. and it's a chasing target so just when we see a migration api release for teams uh you yeah. know we also see all these other new features that come out for teams that now we need to be able to migrate uh, yeah. so it's it's a chasing target and a challenge so, so, so they they've made it easy with newer migration APIs. And what's the difference between that new migration API? Uh, I think it's in, is it in beta, uh, and the one that that migration tools are sort of using at the moment, the the GA way of doing things. So the GA way of doing things is quite basic. It allows you to read messages and write messages, but you can't impersonate a user. Um, so. Yeah. A lot of us who have been working with these for a while, you'll see when you write a message, you you capture the metadata in the source on, you know, Steve said at 1326, this message, uh, and it's written by a migration administrator account. And then we would just put that right into the chat message on the other side. Today, there's some uh, enhancements to that beta API where you can actually impersonate the user and preserve some of this information and backdate. Yeah. Um, there's some restrictions in it. Um, you know, there's a lot of concern to your point around fidelity. We don't want to ever be able to, you know, falsify messages in a tenant and, and inject them inappropriately. So, for example, you can't, uh, users can't get into that team uh, into it, once you flip that migration switch and the user can see it. You can't use this API again, and then you have to go back to one of the other other ones. So, good news is our product looks more like it did beforehand. Um, but the the bad news is there are some restrictions there, but they're committed to making it better and improving it. Yeah. So uh, can, can we do things like personal chats and stuff like that yet? There are some ways to do it. There's some creative ways that uh, a lot of the migration tools have been able to, to do to finally bring some of those aspects in. Yeah. Uh, it's a uh, you need to read the instructions carefully because there's also a lot of situational and scenarios that uh, are covered and not covered. So uh, just uh, like every process, you want to test <laughs> this carefully and yeah. be sure you're going through and, and ensuring that your user documentation and your, your expectations are being met because it's quite a challenge right now. Yeah. So uh, looking at everything that's sort of out there at the moment, what's the biggest thing for you that's that's missing from all of these APIs that would make overall tenant migrations easier? So it's a disappointment that these APIs have remained in beta for so long because, uh, you know, you mentioned at the beginning, it's really difficult to, uh, you know, make project commitments and, and things like that as a migration vendor when, when these items remain in beta for so long. Yeah. The biggest challenge is there's still the, the basic items are there. We can move chat, we can move files, we can recreate teams, we can put members in it. But as this sprawl as teams has just exploded, we don't see a matching creation API every single time that there's yeah. a feature shipped. 
and and that's something we really uh, you know and a lot of us that do M and A have been very vocal about is wanting the ability to modify tabs, the ability to uh, you know do tie-ins to third parties, the third party app integrations, all these aspects that. Um, you know, I think what's hard is for end users, they do them once, they do them a long time ago, and then Monday morning after migration, they have to do it a hundred times a task that they haven't done for a year. Um, yeah. So it can be very heavy on a user community when all these items have to be called out and found and detected. Yeah, so I, I agree with you. It's almost as if they should have perhaps a, com a commitment at some point where it's not just security and compliance, it's it's having those APIs as well because there's so much of that sort of behavior uh, at the moment where, uh, especially over the last 12 months, it seems like you know, companies are getting bought on a more regular basis as well or sold off, span out with with, with funding um, so that they can succeed. And then this becomes you know, what one of those things where perhaps it's not been predicted. And I've seen where customers have adopted things like Azure Active Directory, joined devices uh, have really sort of said we agree Microsoft this is this is great let's do it um, you know they're, they're in perhaps a sticky situation you know uh, with with a wider view than the, the me of the of all of these partners and customers that are, are doing this and, and coming to you where do you see you know of the sort of priorities around as your as your DevOps Dynamics, Yammer, as you already joined, Intune. Now, what, what's one of those or, or something else that's top of that list of things that we can't do that people keep on asking for? Azure AD devices have become a very large uptick, particularly in the in in the COVID realities of working, where you know a lot of us don't have offices and and. Yeah. The desire to not go back to the model, or you know, we had to rapidly adjust and, and do that. So I know the ability to move people and devices across tenants like that has been a very large challenge. I know yeah. we're, you know, that's a, a top of mind to most migration administrators where a domain joined device or a, a BYOD device is, is, we can handle those situations, yeah. but this Azure AD join scenario, which a lot of us are on devices and, and enjoy those benefits, when it comes to tenant to tenant, that's just not quite there yet. Yeah, and it's, it's, it is a frustrating problem to have because, yeah, as you know, there's a massive wealth of tooling for migrating computers joined to AD domains. Oh, but you know, what, what what do you what do you do in that scenario? You know, rebuild the device, let the user reset it, and autopilot it back in. It's it's, it's not particularly great, uh, especially custom. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, this is where, you know, uh, providers are able to add a lot of value because it's it's what is the outcome? Um, the yeah. other thing is, what kind of project is it? I always bring people back. What is the purpose of this? Is it a merger, an acquisition, or a divestiture? Am yeah. I carving out a segment of these users? If that's the case, you probably want that device wiped. If it's a collaborative, friendly merger, well, then, you know, you may not touch that device and just when you replace it or three months later, you know, try to drain the machines into the same location. So there's certainly some options there as well to, to leverage it. And uh, finally, if you, in that other scenario where actually you are expecting this to happen soon, you know, you've, you've uh, perhaps moved some core services, OneDrive Exchange, uh, into Microsoft 365 and you're thinking, right, what's going to be next for us? I see these as big benefits to, to the business, but I also know that we're, we're aiming to get sold uh, or that's uh, we know that we're going to get a, a acquired, we're going to carve off a part of the business at some point. Uh, you know, that, that's set in the, the business strategy. Are there any key pitfalls to avoid, any, any corners to avoid getting into if you know that this is on the sort of mid or, or short-term horizon. So interestingly, uh, Rich Dean and I are going to be talking about this in a webinar next week in, in a lot yeah. more detail. But at, the, at a high level where the migration APIs are not catching up with the features, it is a time to pause some of those really exciting things that are coming out, but to maybe not adopt them right away. If you know this is going to be on the horizon, 
it isn't the time to consume, you know, really advanced new features because they're likely not going to move, uh, at least move easily. Yeah. And uh, so I advise, you know, you stop enabling people to create new teams. You, you know, don't turn on all these features and options and, and get yourself ready so you can focus on actually migrating the users and the content instead of yeah. how am I going to do this really odd use case that I enabled two weeks ago. Uh, and I, I suppose there's a balance of understanding what the benefit is going to be to the business, perhaps in that that six months. Uh, power power apps, power automate, uh, being you know an example where there's big gains in terms of efficiency, productivity, uh, automating processes, where that that could then end up with either user based or project based export and re implementation of that functionality the other side. Uh, but it might be worth it in the short term, and it's it's, it's like understanding then what that balance is. So really, that's that that's something where if you join that that tech webinar in a few in a few weeks' time, it's May the sixth that you'll be be doing this. Yep, it's going to be Thursday, yep. May six. Uh, for those of us in the UK, it'll be at four p.m. Uh, and yep. then our uh, my my fellow Americans, it will be uh, eleven a.m. in uh, East Coast US. So not in a few weeks' time. That is next that is, Thursday. It yes. creeps up fast, doesn't it? Does. it? Next Thursday. It does, yes. So we'll put the links to that um, below uh, in the podcast notes. Thank you for joining us on the show today, Mike. Always good to be here, Steve. Good to catch up.